My name's Emily Martin, and I'm taking you behind the scenes to talk to equine artists from around the world. This is Artist Unlocked. Hey, what's up, you guys? Welcome back to another episode of Artist Unlocked. This week's guest is Amy of Zoraida Tack. I always love when I get the opportunity to expand the show into international waters, and so Amy is from the Netherlands, and it was amazing to sit down and talk with her about you know, her studio and how she got her start, the meaning behind her studio name, but also just to get her sort of unique perspective about the international landscape of the hobby. I know it's a lot different for those who are not in the U.S. because Briar and the hobby in general is based in the U.S. So it was really great to sit down with her and talk to her. I think you guys are really going to enjoy this episode. She has a lot of great and thoughtful things to say. As always, definitely go ahead and follow and subscribe to the show wherever you watch or listen to it. And without further ado, let's get into the episode. Um, so for those who don't know who you are, go ahead and just introduce yourself, your name, your studio name, how long you've been in the hobby, things like that. Yeah, so uh, my name is Amy De Waal and I'm a 24 year old artist from the Netherlands, uh, which is a tiny country uh, lodged like right between Belgium and Germany and Europe. So um, you probably don't really know where it is, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've been customizing since I was, I think, 12 years old, but just uh, small, tiny plastic horses, just repainting them in black and stuff like that. But right now I'm doing uh, a lot of re-sculpting and painting larger model horses. So mainly resins and briars. Wow. And, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and then my uh, studio name, uh, it's a bit weird. <laughs> it's called uh, Zoraida Equine Art. And the name Zoraida uh, stems from the fact that I was trying to make it sound kind of Arabic or Egyptian because I uh, started my uh, studio making uh, Arabian tech for model horses. So it wa it wasn't meant to be a, a customizing studio at all, but it kind of evolved into that over time. Wow! <laughs> so yeah, that's an amazing uh, story. Because I was going to ask you how you came up with the yeah. name. So you started with um, Tack completely before you tried customizing, or did they kind of happen at the same time? Or yeah, so um, the repainting and kind of resculpting I did. Uh, at the same time as I was starting to make tech and I found out that I was pretty well proficient at making Arabian tech especially because leather tech is just I'm terrible at that so, <laughs> <laughs> but Arabian tech uh, is fine so I thought okay I seem to be a little bit better at this than all the other stuff so I guess I'll just make my studio about that and then at some point, I guess I had some kind of breakthrough in my sculpting and painting, and then it just became completely about the customizing. <laughs> and uh, I only make the Arabian tech for myself now. Yeah, that's awesome, though. I think it's interesting because the more people I talk to, the more people I discover who started off with tack in some way or another and then progressed there into customizing. So I think, like, the tack making process, definitely there's something to that with, like, um, the skills you learn help translate into the customizing side of things. Yeah, for sure. Like making everything in miniature, you have to be so precise and it really helps to train your eyes and your hands for uh, customizing and painting. Yeah. So um, before you started the tack making and the customizing, like were you a collector when you were a kid or do you just primarily do it from the art standpoint? So... Um, I think I started collecting Sleich horses or Sleich. I really, I still don't no know one knows. how to pronounce this word. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think I started with that when I was seven or eight years old. Um, because in Europe, prior horses are really scarce and we can't really get them anywhere. But mm -hmm. the Sleich are abundant. So uh, <laughs> my collection started out with that. And uh, then it transformed into Grand Champions. Uh, which are the, the plastic horses with the, the real mane and tail and stuff like that. And I still have that collection somewhere in my attic. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
at some point I discovered uh, the prior and resin side of the hobby, mostly through watching uh, YouTube videos of uh, like, uh, for example, Cinnamon Mew Mew was like yeah. one of my, my big heroes when I was a kid. So uh, yeah, that's how I discovered that side and it really, yeah, progressed into a more uh, serious collector uh, yeah. type of thing. And now I still collect, uh, but mostly resins and customs, both by myself and by other artists. And it's more about the art side now uh, than really the collecting side, because my collection is not very large at all. Yeah, my side either. I have like over there, I have a few yeah, from I like when that. I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, they're like the ones that have the sentimental value for me. But yeah, some people have, um, felt like they don't really have like a least favorite side of the hobby so at least a favorite what's your favorite side of the hobby um i guess it's kind of the friendships and like the instant connection that you have with the people that collect model horses because they you just know that they have exactly the same feeling when they uh go up to a real horse and stroke it and they're like whoa oh my gosh it's a horse and it's kind of a magical connection between people uh, that you can to totally be yourself and uh, I, th I guess that that's the most uh, nice thing about this hobby for me it's just a friendship and the camaraderie uh, in the yeah. hobby yeah for sure do you feel like um, that's had a big impact on you since you said like I don't, I don't know much about like is there really like a briar and model horse community in the Netherlands or is it just like you have to strictly kind of reach out online well, it's a it's a small community, uh, and well, so it's it's kind of a, a strange uh, thing because this the country is so small that we can easily just uh, step in the car or a train and go visit each other, but we do live uh, all over the country. So at the moment, especially with the pandemic, we're doing everything online, of course. But before that, we uh, had uh, kind of hobby days uh, quite frequently, like a couple times a year. And we have live shows, maybe once or twice a year. Um, and then we also often visit the German collectors that are right across the border, because it's only a couple of hours uh, to drive and we can visit them. And uh, yeah, it's really nice. It, there's not many collectors. I think there's about 20 that I know of mm. in the whole country that collect uh, uh, Briar and uh, Peter Stone and resins. There's probably a lot more that collect slash, but I, I don't keep track of all of those because <laughs> <laughs> too many. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's cool, though, that there is a community there. Because, like, I, you know, the U.S. is obviously kind of, like, the home base for everything. And so, like, it's interesting for me to hear about what it's like to be a collector and an artist in these other countries. Because I think it's easy sometimes to take for granted, like, the, the events and the access that we have to certain things. And I'm really happy to hear that you guys have like hobby days and stuff too. I think those are becoming more popular in the US. I think sometimes the US can be very like ultra competitive and like um, <laughs> there's like this intensity surrounding it. And so one thing that I think we can take from other countries is I, I noticed that you guys have a lot more hobby days where you guys just get together and have fun and you each kind of do um, the art that you wanna do related to the hobby. So I think that's super cool that you have a nice community around you. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I would I would love to visit the USA to go to the big events like Briar Fest or the Jennifer show. Like yes, that would Jennifer be like show. my dream, but yes. <laughs> not happening anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure one day you can get there eventually. Yeah. I maybe. know I've I've only been to Briar Fest once in my life and it was like when I was young and um yeah, I definitely have dreams of like wanting to go to the Jennifer show or like to go to Nan one year or something like that, but yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I had the, the lucky chance to meet Jennifer in person when she was on holiday. Uh, and she came over with her friend uh, Carol to visit in the Netherlands. And she oh, came yeah. to one of our hobby days. And I met her in person. It was, she was so nice and just be so awesome to visit her show once. Yeah, yeah. it's a big goal. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I remember reading about the articles that when she visited and I like totally forgot about that. So that's so awesome that you got to meet her. <laughs> yeah. um, kind of going along with that, um, what are your favorite moments in the hobby so far? And it can be art related or otherwise. Like what 
favorite memories do you have? Things like that. So I think one of my favorites is from my first live show that I ever went to. It was uh, about four years ago. Um, I went to my first live show here and one of my customs uh, won overall champion of the custom division. So that was like a crazy moment for me because I was like, whoa, <laughs> okay, maybe I should customize more often. And that's <laughs> when that switch from tech to customizing <laughs> happened basically. <laughs> and um, at the same show, uh, my partner, my boyfriend, Robert, he uh, also won uh, one of the big raffle prizes uh, for me. Um, and it was just a really funny experience because he said uh, at the beginning of the day, he was pointing at the raffle prize and he was like, I'm going to win that one for you. Oh. And I was like, sure, sure you will. <laughs> and, and it actually happened. So. <laughs> oh, that's but, so cute. <laughs> yeah, and I still have the horse. So uh, yeah, that's definitely a favorite memory. And another one that I have is uh, when I participated in the Circle C Artist Challenge. Um, that was held in December last year. Um, I participated. I actually have it with me here. I hope you can see. Yeah. <laughs> A little flower horse. Beautiful. And um, I won uh, in my division. I think I, I was in the amateur division. And I won in that. So I was really happy about that. That was so cool. And I loved the challenge. Like it was a completely out of the box uh, challenge. So it was really nice. It, kind of a change of pace from the normal customizing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think, I'm pretty sure that's how I actually found your account um, because all those posts were circulating and I saw it and it, it's a beautiful piece. Um, I, I aspire to do something like that one day. I mean, um, and I think the challenges like that that are coming up in the hobby are really good because they do, they force you to think outside of the box. And the result is like, I think, Obviously, there's a whole slew of colors you can paint horses. So there's like, you know, a ton of options there. But I think it's really interesting to see people think in like a different way like that because it produces some really beautiful pieces. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed looking at all the pieces that were created. They were all so beautiful and awesome. I think the piece that won was actually my favorite uh, out of all of them. It was, I think, the horse shaped as a, a kind of vase. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it was just really gorgeous. And I was like, wow, <laughs> yeah, that piece is really deserved to win uh, the overall champ. So I really hope they do uh, another challenge like this again next year, maybe. Yeah. Because I've heard that probably this year it's not going to happen <laughs> due to the pandemic and uh, stuff like that. But um, yeah, I will definitely participate if it's uh, held again. Yeah. I had a question too. What was it like? Uh, bringing your boyfriend to uh, the live shows because I've done that once and like we've been together for three and a half years so it's like I felt comfortable enough like sharing that side of things with him but like what was that like for you how did he take it <laughs> so this is really funny so I've <laughs> I've been together with him for five and a half years wow. and he's been with me to every single live show I've ever been to and he's actually more competitive than I am. <laughs> yeah, so uh, at every live show, I, of course, bring my horses and the class list and stuff like that and record the uh, results for every horse. So I don't have to do that uh, after the show because I never have time for that or I just don't want to do it after the show. <sighs> so he's kind of like my secretary and he will do that during the show <laughs> for me. Oh. So... Uh, when I go to pick up a horse from the table, he is signaling to me like, like, did he win? And, and I'm like, yes or no. And then he goes, okay. And he's writing it down. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's he's so a fresh. big stress reliever during the show as well. Like yes. getting me food and stuff. <laughs> it's yeah. Great. <laughs> it can be really stressful. I know. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you have horses in like multiple rings at once and you're just trying to get them all up there. But yeah, that's awesome that he's so supportive of you. <laughs> yeah, it's really great. I, I don't know what I would do at live shows without him because I get stressed out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. Um, so kind of pivoting a little bit back to the studio side of things for you. I know artists have like a wide range of like how they work. Some are just working at their kitchen tables and whatever they have access to. 
and then others have, you know, entire studio spaces. What does that look like for you? Uh, I'm currently sitting in my studio. <laughs> well, it's uh, it's my kitchen, basically. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sitting at my kitchen table. It's a, a small table of like a square meter. So <laughs> there's not really a lot of space. Um, and I do all of my work here. I don't have a dedicated studio space because uh, I currently live in a small apartment. So uh, I do hope to have a dedicated studio space uh, when I buy my first house or if I move to a larger apartment at some point because it's it's slightly uh, inconvenient having to clean up all the stuff every time that we have to make dinner and, and things like that so hopefully in the future but for now this is okay <laughs> yeah yeah I think um I other than like you said like the inconveniences that you know you have to pick it up every time um, I think that, you know, working out of your kitchen is totally fine. I do it still. I have like a little desk that's like five feet from me there, but I also like sometimes I just work at my kitchen table too. And, um, but yeah, that's cool. Do you? Yeah, it's really like a handy spot that I'm in because I don't know if you can see, but the tap is like right behind me. So oh, yeah. if I get my glass, I can just do like that and I have an instant <laughs> drink. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Yeah, there's some convenience to it. <laughs> I was interested in learning a little bit more about like what mediums and tools that you use. Like what are your primary things? What are your favorite things? So for sculpting, uh, for example, if I want to customize a mane and tail on a horse, uh, because I do that a lot uh, on resins and plastics as well. And I really like to do these uh, huge kind of wild hairdos. So <laughs> It's a, you need kind of a good armature for that. So I just use um, kind of thin wire, uh, a, a couple millimeters across uh, and just twist a couple of those together for uh, like the base of the tail. Then I drill a hole, for example, into the horse and just super glue and baking soda. That's like the best combo ever. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so that's uh, my go-to for making uh, armatures which I then cover with uh, painter's tape uh, because I've learned that uh, from Laura Skillern. Uh, she had a blog uh, some years ago and I think I first saw it on there. Uh, and I found this method and I was like, this is so, so smart. So I started doing that and I still do it now. Um, and after that, it's just covering with uh, epoxy sculpt. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I learned that same method too. I use it all the time. It's genius, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> and then for like uh, sculpting the hairs itself, I don't really have specific super useful tools or anything. I just use uh, one of those standard wooden uh, sculpting tools. And I have a couple of uh, small round metal balls on a stick. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what they're called. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> So I have those in a couple of sizes and then I have some needles for like the really tiny things on stable made size horses. Mm. But that's it. Uh, yeah, and then a couple of old paint brushes to smooth everything out. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that I don't really use special uh, tools there. Uh, and for the painting part of it, I use uh, oil paints. Mm. So I uh, usually base coat in acrylic just hand painting uh, a base coat and then hand paint in oils over it also not really any special <laughs> ingredients there <laughs> yeah yeah so that's, that's it. i'm actually interested in oils because i i love the vibrancy that they can give and um one of the issues i've been having with them is like the streakiness at first like it just takes so long and so it's interesting because so you don't you don't airbrush the um base coat you just hand paint with acrylics yeah so um usually for if i want to paint like a brown color like chestnut or bay um i start with a kind of coppery light brown uh base coat it's kind of like a medium tone between the darkest and the lightest one that you want to paint mm. um, and that's just all hand painted with a brush uh, in a few layers just trying to keep everything smooth yeah 
uh, then I seal between, of course, because acrylics and oils don't really mix. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, it's uh, for, for the oil part, it really is a steep learning curve, I would say. It uh, took me quite a few tries to get it right. Um, and the streakiness, I have that too, so <laughs> don't yeah. worry about that. Oh, like, the first few layers always look terrible, terrible, terrible. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to like remind myself, I'm like, just push through the process, just trust the process, because it is, it's hard to like, it, they look like terrible, but then they do eventually get better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's, it was kind of a switch for me uh, from pastels, because I used to paint in pastels, but I always got like kind of grainy results so I went looking for a smoother medium um, and with pastels of course you have each layer that's kind of um, well it, it looks smooth and it looks nice um, and with oils it's really not the same at all so yeah. so that was frustrating but yeah like you said just push through the ugly stage yeah <laughs> most important thing yeah for sure um, do you have a favorite and a least favorite scale to work in? Okay, yeah. Um, so least favorite, Micromini, because they're just too small for me. <laughs> I've tried uh, resculpting one uh, and it worked out, kind of. But that's the last one I ever did and ever will do <laughs> because <laughs> they're just too tiny for me to resculpt. And uh, painting they're okay to paint, but not my favorite. Um, and a favorite scale, not really. Uh, I like anything from stable made to traditional. Uh, it's all great. Do you have any tips for young artists, artists looking to get into doing what you're doing, trying oils, you know, trying the hobby in general even? What would your tips be? Um, so... My, yeah, my first general tip is kind of don't be scared to try new things because for me it never works the first try <laughs> and I had to try a lot of different media and a lot of different uh, sculpting materials to really find uh, the ones that work best for me because there's not like the kind of one size fits all um, thing in the model horse hobby you just really have to find what works for you um, and also really look at tutorials online because this helped me so, so much. Okay. Um, yeah, so just on YouTube or on someone's blog, wherever, just uh, look at their info and try their, their technique and see if that works for you. For sure. So that's uh, my, like my main tip. <laughs> yeah. And also remember that everyone starts somewhere and my uh, customs and sculptures did not look like this 10 years ago. <laughs> so you really have to keep practicing and practicing and you will see that there is uh, improvement in there. Yeah, for sure. Good tips. <laughs> um, this is a big question. Some people haven't known how to like approach this, but what's one thing, it could be art related or otherwise, what's one thing that you'd like to see more of in the hobby? Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So, um, yeah, I would say maybe kind of more um, real life workshops, maybe where you can teach uh, the younger generation or older generation, for that matter, uh, the skills that you have, because uh, I usually only see workshops uh, advertised at Briarfest and stuff like that, or at least in the Netherlands, we don't really have uh, in-person workshops. Mm. Uh, and I would love to see more of that so that you can really get the hands-on experience from an expert, uh, because that would be even better than looking at blog posts and YouTube videos. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, I totally agree. I think... I mean, for me anyway, I'm like a very visual learner and I have to like be there physically. And so I think like having an expert right there that I could literally just ask questions as I go would be like so helpful. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Overall, what does the hobby mean to you? That's a big one as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting deep at the end here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what? Yeah. 
Oh, what does the hobby mean to me? Um, well, first of all, it means just uh, having a really close connection with the people in the hobby that really understand you. Um, and also just having lots of fun at live shows or uh, wherever, at events, just doing things together. It's like really like a friend group, at least in my case. I really consider these people my friends. Um, and yeah, it's all because of the hobby and that's great that it's it brings people together. Uh, so that's uh, the main thing, I think. Yeah, yeah. for sure. I think, um, at least for me anyway, it's like, it allows me to kind of have something that's just something that I love to do that's like not related to like work or school or whatever. And just gives, I think it gives a lot of people just a place to, like you said, like, of, you know, like-minded people, you know, we all get the horse crazy thing. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to explain why you have a hundred miniature horses in your cabinet. <laughs> yeah. You're just like, uh, oh, whatever, I have those two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are your future goals? These could be short-term goals, long-term goals, just goals overall. <laughs> So I think uh, probably releasing more artist resins um, because I released this guy last year. Uh, it's the, the mini Akoteke resin called Ozan. Uh, and I have an Arabian in the works, which I also conveniently placed next to my computer to show you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. A little wearing uh, Arabian. And I hope to get this one released uh, this year. He was scheduled for uh, next month, actually, but um, due to the pandemic and everything, I haven't really gotten around to working on him much. Uh, but that's definitely my main goal for the next few years and also releasing uh, a traditional skill sculpture. Uh, I have a couple in the works, but uh, we'll see which one makes it to the finish line <laughs> the first. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, also painting more horses because I feel that my painting skills are finally kind of at the same level as my uh, sculpting skills. So I do plan to paint more horses and possibly also some sales pieces and things like that. Awesome. Yeah, looking forward to the sculptures. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I like to give this last little bit kind of up to you. Plug your work, tell people where they can find you, what they can be, you know, looking ahead for, things like that. Yeah. So um, my main account that I'm active on uh, is my Instagram account. It's uh, sarayda.tech. Um, yeah, you can see from the username that the, the tech side of the hobby was the first thing I started with. <laughs> um, and I also have a website that's still kind of under construction. It's a Zoraida Equine Art. Uh, it's also linked in my uh, Instagram bio and that's where I will be uh, posting updates on sculptures and adding horses to the, the gallery of customs and painted pieces. Awesome. Uh, and I'm not on Facebook, at least uh, not with my studio yet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to look into making an account for that. Uh, but who knows how long that will take? <laughs> I'm not exactly, I'm not exactly uh, very computer savvy. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, awesome. uh, I guess that's it. Uh, yeah, things to look forward to uh, is the, the Arabian uh, sculpture for now. Yeah, that's awesome. I'll have things either floating in the text here or in the description below where people can check you out. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, you guys, that was the episode. Thank you guys so much for watching. Definitely go ahead and check out Amy. I will leave all of her links in the description below. She's a super talented artist, so you're definitely gonna wanna go ahead and follow her. I know I've been teasing some fun things on my Instagram, some fun things coming for this channel. I originally was hoping to launch it today, but I have had some delays and unexpected things pop up. But I promise I'm gonna get this little surprise out into the world as soon as I can. I definitely want to get it out by next week, so definitely go ahead and follow me on my Instagram for when I announce that. Next week's guest is going to feature Erica. Her Instagram name is Performance Fanatic. That's probably where most of you guys know her as, so you're definitely going to want to stay tuned next week for her episode. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next week!